This is EdTech Weekly 207, the final EdTech Weekly of 2011. Uh, you got the three guys here, Jen, Dr. Madrigal. We don't know if she'll be joining in last minute, uh, but we got the top stories of 2011, a few black swans, and look back at top stories of 2010 coming up. This is Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea. Cormier in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. John Schinker in Stowe, Ohio. 2011, go. I love 2011. That's that's all let's, I'd say about it. Let's talk about 2010 then. Okay, perfect. How do you feel about 2010? A year ago, you were telling us all about how the world had changed, and uh, do you still feel that way, Dave? Um, well, I'll tell you, the looking back at your think, the your only list. constant is change. The only constant <laughs> is change. Uh, I think it's interesting how you know the the things that happen in pieces and you try to track them and they don't quite work out for you. So when you look at the, the, the free comment, you know, free is dead, which is the, the number 10 thing on the list from last year, because Ning was starting to charge and um, the, you know, talk about Yahoo was talking about dumping delicious and all that stuff. And it really hasn't had a huge impact if only uh, people have moved more and more towards, you know, Facebook as a platform. And I think when I, when I think about that, sort of comment last year, that's what I'm seeing more and more now. So I'm less hearing people say, oh, there's these variety of things I'm thinking about using. What I hear, at least in my own work, is let's do that on Facebook because people have trust in it that it's not going away. It's free-ish, but uh, I think that whether that's led has been an increasing reliance on Facebook. In an educational context, oh. people want to do it on Facebook. Context. Well, I mean, I have... Um, any number of student groups at my university, for instance, that any time they want to do anything with other students, they go towards Facebook because it's a thing that they understand, a thing that they trust, and some stuff that we had tried to get started a few years ago on different platforms is all kind of faded away because you know people have seen stuff come and go, and they see Facebook as more iconic. And any time that we talk about new programs to interact with students, universally now I hear Facebook. I don't know that that that's entirely true in the K-12 arena where Facebook is still very evil. Uh, not that we're not using it, uh, but we're mostly using it for PR. Uh, we're not doing very much with having students actually interacting and, and using it educationally. But uh, your point rings true, you know, just regarding the number of services that we're using and the types of services that those are. So we're still putting a lot of stuff into Google Apps and doing a lot with Google Docs and um, you know, just excited about all of those tools that are available and yes, they're all free, but again, as you say, Dave, it, it's a company that we have grown to trust for good or ill, um, but a company that certainly we think is going to be around for a while as opposed to going out and finding some you know, new service that might do some really neat educational thing and investing a lot of time professional development, energy, uh, planning into it, and then have uh, the rug pulled out from under us uh, down the road. So I think, I think uh, we're seeing a little more caution, especially with, with educational technology people, but also teachers and administrators into um, what types of services they're willing to, to get behind and, and really uh, support. All right, other 2010 stuff in review, pads. Where do we think pads are these days? I see them in an awful lot of my meetings. Um, <laughs> I don't see students doing a lot of work on them, at least in my environment, but I do see an awful lot of the... It, it seems more like a business tool than it seems like a study tool at this point. At least that's been my sort of... Uh, my sort of look at it, is I don't see a lot of kids sitting down and getting their assignments done on a pad. I still see a lot of laptops, but... Um, you know, pretty much everybody in the administration at my university has a pad. I think the change from the 2010 list here is uh, Dave started it off by saying iPads, black pads, and Android, oh my. Um, black pads and Android are gone. You know, Android is has not stepped up to the plate regarding uh, tablets, and it is basically Apple's ballgame at this point. Um, we see no discussion of comparing different platforms or even wanting to evaluate different platforms or, you know, let's look at the Fire or let's look at, uh, you know, whatever Android tablet is coming out this week. Nobody cares. It's all about the iPad. And that's it, it, that's very unusual in, in my school district, which has, 
you know, Ben not used Apple products for 10 years, but uh, this is one that our teachers are excited about, our administrators are excited about. Now, of course, the the challenge is how do we use it, as Dave said, educationally? How do we uh, actually make uh, productive use for this and and use it in a way that, that's cost effective and beneficial for students? And I think a lot of schools are struggling with that. As I talked to some researchers who are doing work with iPads in education, um, that seems to be pretty common that schools will go out and buy them and start playing with them and then try to figure out, okay, what is it good for later? Um, you know, which, which uh, leaves a little to be desired in the in the designing for uh, educational use department. But why do you think um, Android has fallen short as a, a, a pad or tablet OS, whereas in the mobile world it seems to be holding its own? It's a good question. Uh, you know, Apple beat them certainly beat them to the punch, and uh, I was I was surprised to see Android as as a phone really gain the traction that it did because uh, Apple had such a, a head start there, a couple year head start. Uh, in the tablet world, they just got the traction. You know, it, it's the same kind of thing as why why are people still on Delicious and not Digo? You know, Digo is certainly a better product, but you know, if everybody's on Delicious, if that's where everyone has gone, that's where the community is, I'm then they're going to get behind it. I gave up on yeah. Delicious. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And I mean, if you look at the, even Android on the phone, I know all three of us are Android users, which, you know, makes this a slightly biased discussion. But there's no comparison between the way the iPhone works and the Android phone works, in my opinion. They're, the Apple product is at least twice as good. Um, my camera is kind of a little bit better. The quality, like um, the integration is better in some cases, but in terms of picking it up and just using it, the Android's always an extra step. There's always another thing I have to understand. I have to work through it. Whereas with the iPhone, I never had to learn anything. I don't think I opened an instruction manual the whole time I owned my iPhone. And I dug all over the place with with my phone, trying to get it updated on my Mac, just trying to get new versions of it up, trying to get all, it's just, it's a pain. I still haven't gotten the, uh, mm. the OS updated on it since I bought it, because I can't figure it out. See, and I've never had any problems with my Android devices in that regard. From a tech perspective, you know, doing the updates, it's just, uh, they push them, the, the mobile company pushes it out to you. Um, what is frustrating is that Android is so segmented, because it is open and that's one of the the disadvantages of open is you have a hundred different phones to choose from instead of one and so you've got different manufacturers adding uh, little pieces of software on it so the the experience isn't exactly the same um, you've got buttons in different places you have you know those kinds of issues with it I do like the openness the fact that anybody can create apps for it that you can add different marketplaces instead of uh, running everything through the Apple Store. I think from a school perspective, from a management perspective, it, it's much easier to go with something like Android. But, um, you know, again, apps-wise, they're not there. You know, you can't have something like GarageBand or some of the digital storytelling apps are, are phenomenal on the Apple uh, on the Apple platform. So, and our, our teachers are excited about it. Our, our principals are excited about it. Our curriculum directors really want to use it, and, and that's half the battle. In a related story from last year, everyone's switching to Google, including the University yeah. of Alberta had switched to Google Docs. I don't know how much we want to get into Google Plus at this point, but any retrospective thoughts on that? I wouldn't even retrospect. I'd say the thing we're doing right now is the killer that it didn't have before. You know, when I when we talk about what it costs for Illuminate now, whatever Collaborate is now part of Blackboard, which at what point do they say you've got to buy the whole package, right? So, I mean, they've sort of cornered the market on what everybody agrees is the most reliable um, web conferencing platform, which amazingly in the first six months they've owned it has become less reliable, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I think is kind Are of... Are we going to talk about Microsoft and Skype here in a minute too, Dave? Well, <laughs> so, I mean, and then you look at this platform here, you know, we've only got 10 people in here, but how big a step is it going to be for, for them to say, meh, 40? You know, the computer power that those guys have, those are the kinds of decisions that they can just make. So if all of a sudden, if this has 40 or 50 and the chat room gets a little bit more sophisticated and we share a whiteboard and whatever, you know, 
and then you integrate it with Docs, and you integrate it with what you've got an LMS, right? And an LMS that has video conferencing built in and email and all the rest of it. I mean, and you know. autonomy or, or ownership of data afterward. I mean, I that's what I love about using Google for Education is that and it's can, free. Yeah, but there's one <laughs> other missing piece. You're not allowed. We're not allowed to use it. K twelve is not allowed to use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Still, you guys are K twelve. Whatever. Yeah, but <laughs> but we're K twelve. No, no. You in the states aren't allowed to use it in K twelve. You're allowed There's to use it in K twelve. Five and a half billion other people that don't live in your country. Okay, but that's a Google. Canada you're talking about the Google policy it? for Google Plus, which Google would, of course, Plus to hang out as well. Right. Um, so, can you use Google Plus with your thirteen to seventeen year olds in Canada? Oh, I don't know. They're rebels there. They don't follow rules. Hint, no. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, it's, it's not a big leap, right? Like, it's not... If they wanted to, they could. Oh, yeah. If they wanted to, they could. But they haven't. Up well, to this point. And that's where... Stay tuned to 2012. I, absolutely. And when I talk we about... Will Black Sw <laughs> That's right. When I talk about <laughs> black swans and the possibility of dramatic effects having impacts... If Google all of a sudden decides to build the whole package and it's all free, and they run Google Books through there and Scholar and all that stuff, but you take the whole Google package and you wrap it up neatly and it works, right? Then all of a sudden every computer, pretty much every computer in the world, now lacks all of the problems that John has with his, right? Downloads, mm -hmm. all the rest of this stuff has just all gone away. And then all well, of a sudden you have a place where you can just pick up whatever platform like okay let's have a school now well let's go grab some books and we'll go to the Google book thing and bring them in and you know it also makes the iPad a usable device you know in terms of managing documents and consuming content and you know working with different formats and DRM and you know we have to have an iTunes account for every device and then a facilitator accounts and it's it's just a mess dealing with the the device that's not really designed to be used by an organization. I mean, I, th I, mean, I think logistically and, and legally it would be a nightmare for Google. But let's say they decide mm -hmm. to do it just for fun. I mean, do they have the programmers to get this done in the next 12 months? Of course they do. Yeah. So they pull all the pieces they have, and the pieces are really all there right now. They put all those pieces together. And then all of a sudden, like you say, iPad all that stuff, my phone, all those things end up working. So then when, you're, um, when your classmates are working on their assignment, I get a beep that says I got a Google Plus update from my circle and blah, 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 blah. You know, all of a sudden the connectivity goes through the roof. Tell me about your use of Google Plus versus your use of Facebook, both of you. I don't has use it, Facebook. Has, you don't use Facebook at all? Well, I mean, I will resend. If there's a picture of my kid, I might like it. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody tags me, I get an email and I go and check to see if it's some embarrassing photo from my childhood. So you don't um, go to Facebook on any kind of regular basis then? No, no, no. And you I do, do actually, I, I check at least once a week in order to make sure that somebody hasn't direct messaged me something that I need to know. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Because my mom would tell me if there was something in the family or whatever. Really, the only reason I still have Facebook is because I have an extended family that uses it to keep in touch. See, I'm still Facebook. And I don't post on Facebook because it, it just grabs stuff from Twitter. And, and that's pretty much how I get updates in there. But I still keep touch with other people there. So I'm mm -hmm. still going to Facebook fairly regularly, You know, at least every couple couple days, once every couple days, as opposed to Plus, where I haven't really built the community as much. Um, right. So I'm on Plus a lot less often. Yeah, and I, I, I use Facebook all. for kind of event listings, which is part of what I need to do for Career Bridge. Uh, I will look through my Facebook stream once or twice a day. I will look at my Google Plus stream once or twice a day. I barely ever post on either. Or, th or that's not true. I'll post webcasts on equally on both infrequently. So Jeff, Jeff's the omnivore. He does everything. Uh, other Check 2010 splurk. stories yeah. we want to discuss. Uh, research is dead. End of research. Well, certainly, I mean, we keep seeing that with uh, 
the way that people get listened to and taken up. I don't think there's a whole lot of connection anymore between ideas that get taken up and how much research was put into them. I'm not a big believer in, in the sort of formats of research anyway, but there are a lot of sort of pop writers who have an awful lot of impact, and mostly journalists, who have an awful lot of impact on the field now who really haven't done anything in what you'd call research. So if you look at the the edupunk, what's her name, Anya, um, who, write, who wrote the edupunk thing, the book, or you look at somebody like uh, Friedman, you know, they're journalists who write and then people take them up and all of a sudden it moves to policy. Uh, that seems to be the direct link. Be popular. All right. I'm ready to move to 2011 unless anyone else wants to uh, bring something else up. Nope. What was your favorite thing in 2011, Jeff? Um, my favorite tech thing, I'm going to have to go with not just Google+, Plus. But Google renovation slash integrations and Hangouts. I love Hangouts. What we're doing right now. Uh, the fact that we have a reliable multi video teleconferencing option for me was a very happy thing. What about you, John? What was the happiest thing of 2011? Happiest thing? Happy. Best technology happy. thing? Happy? Happy? Come on. Come happy. on. Give me some happy. <laughs> John doesn't do happy. Give me some, give me some happy. happy. I'll put the reindeer back on again. Do it. <laughs> no, I, I, I was happy to see social media growing up in, in the sense that... Oh, that's a nice one. We've got Arab Spring stuff that, that we can talk about all night, but... Uh, Using Twitter, using Facebook, using social media is now an accepted way to get news and to communicate with each other. And that's something that's new. We're not just on the fringe of society now. Uh, this is something where it's much more mainstream, much more expected that people are using social media tools to communicate with each other, to organize with each other, um, to get news out, to start revolutions. I mean, we saw that. Certainly, I don't want to overplay the, the role uh, in the Middle East and in Africa, but also you saw in the Midwest of the United States where social media is used and, and played a big role in Wisconsin and in Ohio on, um, on the uh, uh, political uh, climate there where, where we have governors trying to dismantle public education and, and break unions and that sort of thing. Um, we saw it in the Occupy movements all over the country and all over the world where social media plays a huge role in uh, those kinds, those organizations being able to communicate internally and with the rest of the world. Uh, I just, I think it's been really nice to see this stuff take off and become so mainstream. And I, I think it's also become, uh, you know, much more ridiculous for schools to argue against using them. And that's something that's come up you know, personally for me in the last month or so, where there have been several situations where I've been with administrators and, and really they kind of got it. You know, the light bulb went off where they mm -hmm. said, you know, it doesn't make sense really for us to be blocking YouTube anymore. And um, we're not really sure about Facebook yet, but, it, you know, why would we block Twitter? You know, what, what's the use case there? What, what's the liability? Why are we doing this? And so we're starting to see schools ask those questions and, and really rethink um, you know, their filtering policies and acceptable use policies and uh, starting to allow students to actually use some of these technologies. Yeah, I've seen this, the mainstreaming of social media here too. I, was at a, I did a presentation a couple of months ago and I was in the midst of it and somebody said, well, why would I want to use that Twitter stuff anyway? I don't care what anybody had for breakfast. And about five people turned, at them, turned around and just kind of went, what are you even talking about? And it wasn't a particularly media crowd. It was a, there were arts and crafts um, sort of uh, vendors. They're small business the, owners. The regular people now saying Regular that, people. That. And, yeah. and then like half a dozen people went, that's not, that has nothing to do with that. What are you even talking about? And I find that that I'm no longer in the minority whenever I'm talking about these things. And the conversations I'm having aren't, I want to be on Twitter. It's okay. So if you're going to do it this way, you need to choose what you're going to do and how much, you know, it's, it's far more developed and detailed conversation. Bonnie and I got invited to come back to uh, talk to the Department of Education here in PEI this year, uh, which is coming up soon, now that I think about it. 
and to do essentially the next version. Last time we talked, hey, social media can be cool, great way to professional development, et cetera, et cetera. This year, they want the next one. Like, what happens now? Mm -hmm. So we have accounts, we follow some people. How do we make this work out for us? Right. And so I'm seeing a lot more of that, too. So what's your uh, happy story of 2011, Dave? I love the Hangouts and I love the social media. Mine is people are addressing the what I think is the most important question, which is why are we doing this education thing anyway? I remember uh, probably where I got the, the language for it was Will Richardson was asking that question earlier in the year. You know, you look at the, the project that, um, oh, I had his name five seconds ago and I didn't write it down because I was sure, Doug Belshaw did the open, the why education thing. Mm -hmm. You know, where they did, I don't know, 50 people did pieces on why education, why we should do this thing and what exactly it is. And I think when I look at educational reform, the biggest issue is that for the most part, we're talking about the product of education, like the end of it. And really, we need to step all the way back and ask ourselves why we've got these kids stuffed in a classroom to begin with. Figure out what that is and commit to it. And then talk about how we go about educating people. And I think that that's the that's the, the where the testing thing always misses out because if the goal of, of school is to make sure that someone's passed the test I don't know why we would do that unless there's a good reason but I just I don't know that a lot of the people who defend that position know what that reason is you know and I found that I've seen a lot of people talking about that this year and it makes me I find it really encouraging those are conversations we're starting to have for the first time in a decade or more in our schools which you know you pull out the phone and say they have the answers they're right here so why are they coming to school? And our teachers and our administrators are starting to engage with that and getting beyond how do we increase another 2% in our test scores so that we can maintain excellent with distinction or how do we meet AYP or how do we you know, meet the needs for this disaggregated subgroup and how do we you know, spend all of our energy making sure that these two kids pass the test because if they pass the test then their subgroups pass the test and that means that we are a good school still. And we're, we're start, starting to back away a little bit from that crazy focus on you know, small groups of students making small gains on tests which have huge impacts on how schools perceived and starting to really focus on what are they doing here in the first place. Um, so you're right. It, it's great to, to see us having those conversations. How widespread do you think that conversation is? I mean, how much is that just inside baseball, a small group of ed tech geeks are asking it, that question? How much it, is it hitting It could be. The example that I think of is the recent <laughs> debate between Steve Hargaden and Larry Sanger. I don't know how much of that you actually caught, but Steve Hargaden is an educational person in England and he is a professor Wait, I'm sorry technology. Steve Hargaden St pardon me Steve um, <laughs> wrong one Buckteeth uh, Tim Buckteeth is his uh, Twitter handle um, Wheeler Steve Wheeler and he wrote this long piece about how we shouldn't be doing content in classrooms and why do we learn Shakespeare and all the rest of this stuff which I think is too far down the road of changing the classroom and there was a response by Larry Sanger, who's um, co-founder of Wikipedia, not in the education space specifically, uh, but responding to what all of those education people are talking about nowadays and how it upsets the Enlightenment approach to education. And I think that it's, that it's the sign of it slipping outside of the inside baseball discussion and having a whole bunch of other people go, well, that's not what education was like when I was a kid. And, and the more that those people get pushed, and the more that those questions get asked, I think, the better chance we have of actually having a rational discussion about it. I, I've gotten to the point where I'm not even sure I care what the outcome is. I just, I can't, I, I find it increasingly frustrating, and particularly as my kids start to get into the system, to have an entire system set up and running without anybody having a clear idea of why they're doing it, you know, right. other than just to perpetuate the system. And John, I'm curious, as someone who's in the system, at least here in the States, uh, mm -hmm. how has the economic situation of 2011 affected things? I mean, budgets started going down significantly, well, forever, but especially 2010, 2011. Has it resulted in any economic efficiencies? Has it encouraged use of open content or just fired art teachers? Uh, <laughs> fired art teachers a lot. Detroit. Um, yeah, I mean, increased class sizes. We are seeing 
um, sort of a muddying of the waters to, to some extent where uh, one of the observations I made in the 21st century uh, schools conference that I went to a week and a half ago was that this was put on by the Ohio Department of Education with cooperation from ETEC Ohio and a local university and a local school district. The state superintendent for public instruction was there. Four of the of the state board members were there. But the director of the state office for 21st century education was not there because his office has a different definition of 21st century schools and his definition of 21st century schools is less expensive schools and so his whole uh, take on things is we should be increasing the efficiency with which we are educating our students and that means making it uh, a science and not an art, making education a science and not an art. So doing stuff like Khan Academy, which is great for skill development, where you put the kid in and say, go, and they watch video and they do exercises and it keeps track of where they are, what they've mastered, what they haven't mastered, and it goes, you know, basically sequentially through the, the list of skills and make sure that they master each skill before moving on to the next one. And when they're done, they know all the stuff. And that's a very efficient way to provide a skill-based or information-based education to our students. Um, and, and we see schools heading in that direction because it's economically more viable. Uh, you can outsource classes, for example. You have students take classes online, and or they can go to, you know, you have a charter school or an online school that will uh, allow students to take individual classes. So maybe I don't offer calculus in my school, but I can pay $400 and have a kid take uh, calculus electronically from a computer lab or media center in my school and they can do that more efficiently because they're paying the teacher you know thirty thousand dollars a year and I'm paying them sixty thousand dollars a year so uh, it's economically see... more viable in two ways because the other way is that whenever you get funding from somebody if you can give them back a number of success mm -hmm. that becomes it's an awful lot easier for people to invest people more comfortable investing whenever they know that the thing that comes back is something that can be counted Right. And that's the thing about the Khan Academy. You know exactly what comes back. There's a number. It's like, it's actually a number. You've got 40,002 points. Right. So it's it's quantifiable, uh, easy to measure, and therefore important. Um, I, I think that at the local level, we are, we're having lots of problems with the teacher burnout, with morale, with... Um, community members saying that teachers are overpaid and that they shouldn't be, you know, they shouldn't be getting the health care benefits that they're getting, they shouldn't be getting the retirement benefits they're getting. So a lot of attacks, you know, personal attacks on teachers and professional attacks on teachers, um, which is making their job much less appealing. Um, so, and you know, so that's one of been the a things difficult I, thing to work with. I mean, I, I hear from America, I see here in Korea as well is morale problems because the teaching job involves less teaching and more other stuff other stuff being paperwork and testing and and no one enjoys that how has this year been for that are we further from no child left behind are we more entrenched and, I think just, and also we welcome non-american or korean perspectives are <laughs> I think from a, from a teacher's perspective, things haven't really changed all that much. Uh, there, there's certainly an emphasis, somewhat of an emphasis, on uh, data-driven decision making and and using test scores to inform or uh, you know test analyses to to inform where intervention needs to be made. But for the most part, the teachers are doing the same stuff that they've been doing for the last uh, many years. The difference is they're doing it with more students and they're doing it with less planning time and and more classes and and so uh, we have larger class sizes in fact last year we increased all of our computer labs from uh, 30 computers to 34 computers because we, ha we have all these classes with 31 32 33 students in them and you know uh, that's not unusual at all and I'm in I'm in a relatively rich school district so I think uh, we're getting used to you know, numbers in in the 30s now for class sizes and that certainly has an impact on the teacher's ability to individualize instruction and uh, students ability to get the attention that they need That's a crazy system <laughs> <laughs> now is, is it so like Canada are they just not you know wallowing in testing and paperwork we have five teachers per student in this uh, in this country I'm joking 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But you don't have any. I thought you were going to. I thought you were. I thought you were going to say you had five teachers in your country. <laughs> well, there's only fifty of us up here, so uh, it's still still a ten to one ratio. Um, I think that um, education. I think it's pretty much the same as in the states. It's a provincial issue here in Canada. Um, so. It, the response is very different in very different places, and, and the funding is not tied in the same way that it is new. While we all get our funding transferred from the government, none of it's tied to test scores. So we don't have any of those issues here. Um, while testing, we've certainly um, inherited some of the testing drive from the stuff that's happened in the states. We're in nowhere near the same kind of position because it's, it's not attached to funds. Right. That's the thing about your system that makes everybody get all funky is that no matter how enlightened you may be, you still have to be aware of the fact that you're not going to get the money. And that's that's a reality that you can't avoid. I mean, it doesn't matter how you look at it. So not having that makes it different to start with. Um, I, I mean, I can't speak broadly about the K-12 education system in Canada. I can talk about it on PEI. And, and I know for sure that the the government on PEI is fairly I mean they're they're in a tight spot because we have the lowest test scores in the country not attached to our funding but still kind of embarrassing um, but in a and, couple of years your kids are going to be in school and that's going to all change Dave you're going to take the average way up yeah <laughs> sorry yeah so the I, they they're you know stuck between the do we really go out and measure this and do the because that's that's the big choice everybody's got in front of them right because analytics is really appealing um, there's something particularly complex in I mean take out the the really simplistic test score stuff and it, you can get a fairly broad sort of spectrum on, on what's happening in the education system based on you know extracurricular activities and the touches they have and there's a bunch of stuff that you can do with it that is really appealing fortunately so far it's still um, expensive so people can just do it Right, like the like the New York City government did a couple of years ago, where they spent eighty million dollars on a new student information system. Um, most of us aren't in that position to be able to go out and do that. Uh, I think that they're struggling between that and a really open-minded. Everybody's looking at Finland, right? A really open-minded, sort of engaged, project-based system, and then you end up with this side by side all the time. Do we go this way? Maybe a little bit more to the testing. A little bit more to the project. A little bit more to the testing. I think it's tough. It's a tough place that they're in. Well, I have no doubt we'll continue talking about this in 2012 and years to come. But uh, other 2011 stories or events or least happy moments. Or do we want to move to black swans? Steve Jobs died. Does that have any effect on education, Dave? <laughs> Well, whatever nefarious plan he had for education is now. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you he's being deified here in Korea. He is now sort of on posters and everything as the the new target. Oh, yeah. And 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 like the whole question was, could Korea produce a Steve Jobs? Are we encouraging creativity you enough? Um, he's sort of become a a model of successful creative CEO guy. I mean, I've been I've been abusing his memory. I can tell you that. Um, one of the things that Steve Jobs said in his book is that he didn't believe in doing um, user testing because he didn't believe the users were authorities on what they should what they should get. Mm -hmm. um, and I they find didn't that know what they wanted. They didn't know what they wanted. Nor why would you expect them to, right? And mm -hmm. I find that 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 one piece of information is one that gets into discussions all the time with me, and that's. You know, how much do we consult the student in the way that we design things? How much do we consult? I mean, in terms of whether or not they'll buy it, I mean, Jobs blew that out of the water. He built something no one expected that everybody said wouldn't work, and they kept selling over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, but whoever designed the Zune had the same approach. And <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the difference, isn't it? There People thought somewhere. they didn't want it, and they were right. <laughs> <laughs> they were really, really right. Are you sure they didn't do testing for the Zune? I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know. My um, guess is that they um, would have. So what does Apple look like post-jobs? We, we saw Apple post-jobs once already. Do you think they're going to repeat the same mistakes? Do you... I mean, where do you see this heading? I mean, none of us really know whether or not it was Jobs or somebody else inside that institution, right? He's the 
he's the front man, but the guy who took over has been there a long time. It's entirely possible that he's the driving whatever. I don't think so, but um, you can't replace that kind of person. Um, I think they'll probably fade over a few years. Yeah. Which I think um, they would have anyway. Maybe. 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 I I guess the analogy, and I don't know that I have seen this anywhere else, um, but the analogy that that I would draw with Apple without Steve would be similar to Disney without Walt. That, you know, he was the driving force, the guy who drove everybody nuts, the guy who would not settle for anything less than than insanely great. And, you know, what we saw at, at Disney was they had a lot of momentum going and they had uh, the rest of the 60s were great for them. They had four years without him. Uh, they got Disney World opened and then things, you know, once once the pipeline kind of ran dry, things went went south there for a while. And, um, but they still managed to stay afloat and, and reinvent themselves and, and came back, uh, you know, almost a generation later. So it'll it's be interesting to see buy new talent. talent. M- much yeah. like Apple, they had the money to buy new talent. Right. As and we and were... I think the the uh, the reputation, you know, the the yeah, the history, right. in the brand. And if anything, right. Steve Jobs is going to live on in. In marketing and brand loyalty, I think. Um, other 2011 stories, one of the posts we were looking at beforehand was from Hacked Education, and they mentioned social, the social learning startup Edmodo is on a tear. I hear about it occasionally. Have, has anyone had a sense for what a tear Edmodo is on? I've logged in occasionally. Mm, it's a website, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just... A- I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know that I get that. Okay, just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. I just logged into my Edmodo account. Looks very much the same as it did the last time I was here. Does it look torn? It doesn't look torn. (laughs) I mean, mean, this is sort of like the educational alternative to Twitter, right? I would say Facebook, but... Okay. Okay, I mean, it's got a lot of functionality, but... I I remember them debuting. They seem like a nice group. Good luck to them. Continue your tear. <laughs> tear on. <laughs> uh, black swans? Well, we don't have to go into them, guys. I, I like the, the idea of black swans. So uh, just to, to cover off again, I don't know if that was in the first intro or the second intro. Um, <laughs> a black swan <laughs> is uh, an event that is a surprise, an event that has a huge impact on a given field or the world or whatever. And in retrospect, could have been seen coming ahead of time, right? So, and that's sort of the the features, and it comes from uh, a book that a guy wrote, um, and referring, like, talking about how these things are really critical in the development of the world, and they're also thinking about them ahead of time can be one of those things that can be really useful. I think of Black Swan talk as being useful for two reasons. One, anytime you push the limits on the possibilities of something, it helps you take a different look at how you can reassess how you feel about that issue. And the second one is, well, some of these things might happen, and it doesn't hurt to think about them ahead of time. So I am, um, in, instead of doing a top 10 this, list this year, um, which I couldn't seem to get excited about, I decided to do a top 7 list of black swans that I thought um, might be interesting to think the about. Show? Yeah, I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> you guys have a huge impact on my, on my thinking, guys. <laughs> Um, uh, top seven list and just talking about some things that you know probably won't happen but could and if they did happen in education how dramatic that input would be so to, to the, maybe the easiest one to talk about is the oil one so if oil hits $400 a barrel and I mean it sounds crazy maybe but I never thought it would hit 200 either um, so if it hits 400 what kinds of things what kind of stresses does that place on the education system and how does that push us in new directions right and you know what kinds of challenges would that create, and then what kinds of opportunities would that lead to? So one of them that really fits into the discussion we've been having here is what if the American government invests in analytics? 
So if you take that sort of thing we were talking about where you know you can measure how the student does stuff in Khan Academy and imagine if the New York City government spent 80, 80 million dollars on a student information system imagine the US government spending 80 billion dollars on the Khan Academy essentially and broadening it for the rest of the education system. Um, is it going to happen? Well probably not but it could and if they did what would that mean for education? So all of a sudden we have this massive system that gives all the information as John puts it that anybody could have anybody wants to get out of the system we have a way of managing the personal learning of every single student every single one where they're at how far they've gotten how long it's taken them what time of day they do best work at all of that stuff right what does that do to the education system it entirely automates it entirely automates it but then you could say that gives all those people we're teaching we're paying now to teach time to go and just kinda hang out with the kids and do other stuff and we're getting all the information stuff yeah I wouldn't say it entirely automates mm -hmm. it I would say it gives those who are not automated more information to work with and, and you know one of the points that Khan Academy makes is that we always talk about student teacher ratio but we should be talking about valuable human interaction time and sure. that's what this kind of thing might allow Mm-hmm. John doesn't like it. You hear that tone? Is well, yeah. but it, but if it's <laughs> if it's continually assessing students, providing remediation where it's needed, um, providing acceleration or extension wherever it's appropriate for the student, yep. and it's doing all of that automatically. Yep. Then what is the role of the teacher? To intervene. If it, I mean, if they're hanging out and talking with the kids, you know, it, then school is a clubhouse. We don't need to pay teachers this much money to do that. Let's leave the kids at home and give them a laptop and let them go at it. Like your kids? Like one of my kids, yeah. Was it only one? I thought it was both. No, the other one, the younger daughter is in a uh, magnet school, which is a, a brick and mortar um, okay. performing arts school. And again, I still don't think this means teachers are not necessary. You know, kids are still going to need help learning stuff and the teacher can focus on that. I think there are certain things that cannot be as easily quantified and learned by watching a screencast. And right, but if we're going on... to test things, anything that we can test is going to be quantifiable. I mean, I don't see this system as, okay, now we're going to test everything and anything that can't be tested isn't included. Let's hire the art teacher back. <laughs> you know, let's, <laughs> let's have projects. Let's maybe, have philosophical maybe, discussions. Yeah, maybe. And that's, I mean, that's one way you can go. But when you look at the, the new um, textual analysis software that's out there, they're about, let's call it a year or two, away from being able to say, your essay is not written properly, right, automatically. I mean, whoever thought, I mean, uh, we've probably forgotten at this point, but Google Translate actually works. Now, every time I stop and think about that, my brain explodes because I have no idea how they do it. And I think it's just because they have so much data and so many comparatives that they get sure. there. But we do Google Translate in this house for uh, the notes that come home from the French school because uh, Bonnie's French is still developing. Um, <laughs> you like that, Bonnie? <laughs> um, so, so we use it all the time. And you know what? It's pretty good. Yeah, Korean it's English really is not good. very good. No, but how long before it is, yeah. you know? And that's what I'm saying. Like, how many things are we going to automate? You know, it'd be nice to have well, the art teachers back, but what? Who's going to pay for a building? I mean, we're talking about the oil and stuff from the other black swan. Who's going to play pay for the building for that? But as parents, don't you guys still want your kids to go to a building at some point and do something self-actualizing yes. with other peers? Yes, but that might not be a school. Okay. Or you know, it could. It, it comes. It comes back to that question of what is. What are we doing here? What is education for? And I totally agree with you, Jeff. But I, if the U.S. government heads in the direction of analytics and takes No Child Left Behind to, you know, the next order of magnitude and tracks everything and decides that good education means you get through this system and have mastered this content, then that's the end of public school. Okay. Ta-da. I'm on board with that. I mean, I, I, I... I'm not saying this is a good thing at all. See, I mean, right now I feel like we think education equals school. And I think education equals stuff 
of which school is a subset or part, a slice of the pie. And if there are private institutions filling some of those roles and get some funding or whatever, you know, who knows what model is going to be put together. But mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be, you know, all kids of a certain age group in a certain neighborhood that go and sit in a room together all day. Right. School school may look very different yeah. in the next few years. All right. Man, these black And that might, that might be a good <laughs> thing. So... Um, other than the beautiful black swan image that is on this page. Um, we already really talked about the free working LMS, and that's when I typed it down, because we started talking about this Google LMS that you know is really, really close by, and I think it would have a massive impact on education as we know it. Um, Speaking of which, you know, I think back to EdTech Talk number one when I said, Dave, what is educational technology? <laughs> and we spent a whole bunch of time yeah. talking about Blackboard and Moodle. You talked about Moodle. Yeah. 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 We Where, sure where's did. all that stuff at? How's Blackboard doing? How's Moodle doing? What other I mean, LMS I think alternatives I, are there? That, that battle is still, well, desire to learn, for one. Um, that battle is still going back and forth. I mean, Blackboard, I think, made what may have been the smartest decision they ever made buying Illuminate. Um, I think that that eventual integration, assuming it works, um, is is huge. And I think that Blackboard is moving more and more towards openness and freeness because they realize they've got to close the gap, right, between them and, and that's the rest of the stuff that's out there. I don't know that I haven't seen the new Moodle 2.0 yet. Um, from what I've seen, it's getting more and more. It looks more and more like PHP Nuke all the time. Um, and I don't know, that may be an old school reference, <laughs> but the more, like, we're redesigning our, um, the, the theme for Moodle this year and trying to make it look a little less like something that was developed in 1999. And I think yeah. in terms of its ability to be used in different platforms, its ability to do some of the more complex things that people are trying to do, and that, that integration with this, to me, is it's a killer. Like if you don't have this, if we don't have the ability to go, let's talk about that. Let's have our live session, log into Moodle and we'll do that. I think that it's going to fall apart. And maybe they find a way to integrate it with this and that's how that goes. So, you know, Google Hangout melds with something like Moodle or has a plug yeah, or something. Yeah. And, and just I, to backtrack need it. Go ahead. Well, just to backtrack a bit, one of the stories of 2011 we did not mention is that Microsoft bought Skype and then started dating Facebook. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Where they're integrating this kind of thing into Facebook, which mm -hmm. I can't say I've really taken out for a spin. I've noticed Skype seems to have more problems than it used to. Uh, shocking, knowing that Microsoft is now running it, but... That was a story I wanted to mention. Or ask for insights if you had any. Our, our uh, users are all excited about FaceTime. We've had Skype for years. Nobody's used it except me and occasional foreign language teacher. And once in a while, we'll Skype an author in. But now they're excited about FaceTime. So Skype's dead. I'm sorry, FaceTime? Tell us about FaceTime. It, uh, all I know about it is that it works on an iPad. <laughs> it's video video oh. conferencing for the iPad. Yeah, 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 yeah. FaceTime. Yeah, FaceTime is a uh, is an automated um, Google, uh, Apple to Apple video right. conferencing. It it it, it so allows you much, to much... pre filter out everybody who's not using an iPad or an iPhone, right? It sure does, and because everything that gets used is an Apple webcam using Apple systems with Apple hardware and software, it always works. And it's always crystal clear, so you never have everything. Always looks good. You know what I mean? Because well, they don't allow it to talk to anything else. Is this like the next generation of iChat? <laughs> yes, that's a good way of putting it. And is it multi-camera video or one-on-one? -on -one? Oh, it's one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Right. You don't want to talk to more than one person at a time, Jeff. Why would you? I want to talk to the Come world. On, There's probably an app that'll let you do that. <laughs> so we got black swans to mention. Yep. Um, the, the 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 number one one and the one that I find uh, the most interesting for me is what happens. What is MIT going to do to respond to Stanford? 
So Stanford runs the AI course and 50,000 people log in. And then, you know, the guys are saying, well, we're not interested in giving all those people papers to say they were here. But then MIT looks at its infrastructure. It's been 10 years now. You know, they let off, but nobody cares about the fact that they were first anymore. Uh, so what ha what do they do? I, I've, I've had this, this crazy idea that MIT would go ahead and teach a million people first-year physics um, for years now because they would get an unlimited number of people who'd be willing to say, I taught at MIT, and an unlimited number of students who'd be willing to say, I took a course at MIT. And to me, it's the perfect sort of combination. If they can figure out the accreditation model, they could give a million people first year physics next year. And it seems so doable. All you need is a million divided by 20, but 50,000 TAs, certified That's TAs. It. That's it. That's it. That's exactly it. And I mean, how many people would be willing to do it? It's MIT. You get to say you work for them, and they'd probably pay you something. And then you, you end up with this system where all of a sudden, every other higher educational institution loses all of the money that it's going to make on first year physics. Because those first year mm -hmm. classes are where most of the money is. Right? From a student perspective, if you are teaching, everybody says small class sizes, blah, 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 but every time you teach 200 kids in a classroom, you make money. Right? Because there's one teacher, a bunch of TAs who get paid next to nothing, and 200 kids and they all pay 500 bucks for that class or a thousand or two thousand or whatever it is so the the scale on that for the bottom line of higher educational institutions is important it makes a big difference not so much at an institution like mine where we don't have the big first year classes but at a lot of institutions you know three four hundred people in a first year class 600 is not a not a big deal and those are money makers you know and I, I think, think those that, textbook publishers are quaking in their books, to, books too, in their boots too. You know how many well, books are not going to be sold? Think about it. MIT does it for free, or they sell each textbook for ten bucks. As part of it, you pay a ten dollar textbook fee. That's ten million dollars, right? And then duck it, 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 and you line up the way that they can nickel and dime you, because nickel and diming at a million students turns you into money pretty quickly. Right, and then if it's if a normal course is five hundred bucks, think of the economies of scale that they could make, that they could they could pull the money in from at that. So now, I don't know that they want to do that, but it's just it seems to me that that's a it's an imaginable possibility, and it mm -hmm. fits the three criteria for the Black Swan. Right, mm -hmm. you could have predicted it kind of because I mean we've got open courses of fifty thousand students now. You could see the next step. They have their co content open, all the rest of that stuff. It is. It would be a surprise if they did it, right? <laughs> and then it would have a huge impact on on the field because all of a sudden there'd be a massive shift in the way that people talk about bringing in students, and it would splinter the students off, right? So, if you have ten thousand students in your organization, and seventy five percent of the, they only take seventy five percent of their courses at your institution, and the rest of the courses they take at MIT. That has a massive impact on, on your bottom line, right? All right. Well, has MIT released statistics on what kind of use their uh, open source know. stuff gets? Because it seems like we we talk about it a lot, and everybody holds them up as this is so wonderful because all of these resources are available. But I don't know anybody's actually gone through one of those courses or sent their students to go through one of those courses. So. I've read them. You know, the, the other thing is they may they may take a look at the, the use stats and say, nobody's actually taking advantage of this. Why are we doing it? Mm, I just searched for statistics, and it looks like they have a lot of statistics courses. <laughs> <laughs> I you think, can I think take we... statistics for applications. You can take intro introduction to probability and statistics. Mathematics 18, 4, 4, The uptake overseas has been really strong too, so you, you can't yeah. ignore the, the the impact it's had in a like country like China. You know, there's been sure. huge, huge. And I, you know, I I don't even pretend yeah, that my facetious. little corner of the world is is uh, you know any any way representative. But I was wondering if MIT actually released any stats on that, which they would know, right? Back to the analytic thing. Mm, yeah, there it is. <laughs> Who actually finishes first year physics? So uh, I guess we'll see you guys next year, eh? Yeah. Sure. Is there a New Year's? You want to do this again next year? Is there a New Year's webcast on? I have not made my final decision yet. 
so we'll stay tuned. Know. If there is, Maybe. let us know. All right. We'll you guys will show up. with reasons why we can't show up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, enjoy the home stretch of 2011. Uh, thank you to all of our listeners. Kimberly, thanks for stopping by the chat room. There was somebody in the chat room? Yeah, and Scott Lowe stopped in briefly and left. So if anyone was, is actually listening, happy new year. <laughs> happy, healthy, interesting new year. Indeed. Cheers, guys. Thanks, all. <laughs>